Hey everyone, welcome to Ripstop on the Record. I'm Jameson. I'm Isaac. Today we are talking with a really cool guest, someone that made their own gear for the battlefield and used it. Yeah, this was definitely one of my favorite episodes so far. Um, it's kind of like a part of two of my worlds coming together. Yeah, making your own gear and work at the same time. Yeah, for sure. And the battlefield, I guess. Anyway, this is a really cool episode. You don't want to miss it. Unfortunately, there's no video for security reasons. Our guests couldn't have a YouTube video like that, which maybe makes the episode more cool to listen to, that it's like all secret and stuff. Um, but it's it's 100% worth to listen. We were going to just put a poop emoji over his face. Uh, well, that was that was his recommendation, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, he said smiley emoji. We gave him the benefit of the doubt. That wasn't cool enough. <laughs> that wasn't secretive enough. Yeah. Poop was too identifiable. Anyway... This episode is really unique for a couple of reasons. One, we have this really cool guest, but two, this is our two year anniversary of the show. I was there when we did our very first recording and I can't quite believe that we haven't been shut down in the last two years. Yeah. I remember my first episode with uh, Rod um, when we talked about bushcraft and he Still. told you to never uh, say the definition of bushcraft ever again. The Google definition of bushcraft is skill at living in the bush. Yeah. But yeah, it's been two like, years. Yeah, two years. Well, I guess a year and a half since you did it. But anyway, yeah, it's been pretty wild. We just really want to say thank you for everyone that has listened. Over the last 54 episodes, we've uh, been listened to or downloaded to in about 82 countries. We have surpassed 50,000 downloads. We uh, get all sorts of comments and and messages about how much people love the podcast and how much I've learned. And we really appreciate that. Um, huge shout out to all the listeners, all the MIOGers that have made that happen from our frequent listeners that we've had on to people that just support us. Uh, thank you so much for everything that you do to make this episode or make this podcast possible and for continuing to share your support. Isaac, what is the highlight for you of the last two years? We won't get into this too much, but I just want to know what your number one episode has been since we started. Uh, there was one episode where we were drinking beers that someone sent in and mine was like 9.2% and I had like four sips of it. And then after the episode, like apparently I like tipped a bag of Doritos into my mouth to eat the crumbs and Lance was like, dude, you were so wasted. <laughs> That's your and favorite I, moment. <laughs> yeah. I, re I wasn't wasted at all. Yeah. There was a... <laughs> You teed that up by saying it was a nine percent beer, and you're like, "Why wasn't wasted?" Yeah, yeah, that was a good moment. To be fair, there have been some really cool ones. It's hard for me to pinpoint one favorite moment. Honestly, we've done some cool stuff from the so off for episode twenty eight, our one year anniversary with you, Carter, and Matt. Uh, we talked about new Dyneema's, uh, new fiber from Dyneema, which is pretty legendary. We talked with Hale all about challenge. That was a super cool one. I really enjoyed talking to Dan Durston too. That was fun. The Dan Durston episode just about shut this podcast down. That episode still gets like 300 w listens and watch watches a week. It's kind of crazy. Yeah. He's a really cool dude. And then we've done some cool series like the how to MYOG series with Tim. We did a couple seminars, one about tape, one about stitches. We've been all over the place and uh, we're not stopping now. Obviously we moved up, you know, starting from recording in an office with cheap microphones in Kyle's office now to this prison trailer. We've really made it moved up in the world. Yep. For sure. Uh, so stay tuned. Our next series is going to be uh, how to make license plates. That's news to me as well. <laughs> anyway, uh, can't say it enough. Thank you so much for everyone that has tuned in. We really appreciate it. And now enjoy episode 54. Hey, James. Thanks so much for joining us on today's episode. Yeah, thanks for having me. So give us a little bit of background in terms of who you are and why you're here. All right. Well, I'm uh, James. I have been in the uh, Army for a bit over 20 years. Um, I served as a medic and I uh, deployed overseas to some uh, places such as Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and over the course of those times, I started modifying my gear pretty extensively. Um, so I'm here to talk about. That. So you alluded to it. We're here to talk about DIY on the battlefield. One of the coolest topics or titles I think we've had yet on the show. So let's jump more or less straight into it. What have you made for the battlefield? <laughs> okay. Uh, well, my uh, unique inventions include uh, such failed sewing projects as a <laughs> body armor carrier that uh, I never used. Uh, several body armor carriers I, I did use. 
Um, but essentially everything that a soldier might wear overseas, I've probably modified in some way. Um, and the project ranged sort of from cutting things off to uh, sewing new things on to uh, completely starting from zero from scratch and uh, creating an entirely new piece. The first question that comes to mind for me is I'm scared enough to make something that works like on my bike ride through Raleigh and Cary, which are two pretty safe areas in the grand scheme of things. Is there, does the military have restrictions on what you're able to carry? Like, are you worried about imminent failure in the face of death or? <laughs> yeah. So the answer is yes. And, uh, I would say that at the, uh, kind of introductory ranks, you're probably not encouraged to do that as you, as you move up a little bit, you get some more latitude to uh, make your own stuff. But for me personally, I, uh, realized that you can kind of test things in training before you really experience dramatic failures. So, um, so, so typically I would have, um, a, a event I would do after I had test, I had, uh, you, you created a piece of gear to, uh, to test it. I would, uh, go run or do a training evolution. Sometimes, uh, there's like any number of obstacle courses around the area and you'll find, you know, crawling under something, getting, getting something pulled off of you or whatever can, can sort of generate enough, uh, battlefield like conditions that you, you'll trust a piece of gear. So you mentioned uh, that you have modified or changed, you know, just about every piece of gear you've had. Uh, what were what were the majority of the fabrics that you ran into uh, in those pieces of gear? Yeah. So the Army's uh, kind of, you know, when I first came in, it was it was before uh, 9-11 and the Army was very much using extremely old gear uh typically first created during the 60s. Um, in fact, uh, the the Alice pack that I, I was issued was a nylon uh, variant of a, of a canvas initial uh, make. It was just a new uh, nylon material, well, new <laughs> nylon material. Um, but that and then kind of a waxed nylon uh, belt called the uh, load carrying equipment or LCE uh, was, was sort of what I came in with. And it was just a very, very heavy nylon, uh, and, and then wax impregnated, impregnated nylon material. Um, so think, think metal and nylon uh, when I first got there. And then as that progressed, uh, particularly as, um, you know, after the, you know, war on terror kicked off and money started falling out of the sky, uh, it became very Cordura heavy. Uh, Cordura is the big name is like, I would, I would say it went from nylon and metal to Fastex and Cordura would be the two uh, kind of big names in the, in the business. The army just can't get enough of Cordura, honestly. Yeah. And, and Velcro. Yeah. And Velcro. <laughs> and, and why use 500 D when you could use a thousand? Really, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I enlisted, uh, like right as the army was switching over to the OCP pattern. Um, what, uh, this is kind of a side note, but what was your opinion of the UCP pattern? Okay. Uh, are you talking about the, the ACU, the grade? Yeah. Or, yeah. The, let's, let's first define OCP and yeah. UCP because I don't even know what you're talking about. Okay. So the, the UCP, the um, uniform camouflage pattern, uh, which was the digital yeah. looking uh, like gray and white gravel yeah. looking pattern, okay. um, was the predecessor to the current pattern, which is OCP. Yep. Uh, or operational camouflage pattern, I think. Gotcha. OCP is very, very similar to uh, cry multicam. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in many ways. Um, the the ACU or the U UCP, UCP. Uh, yeah, that was kind of, a, it was gray and white. It was a, it was a very ill-informed camouflage <laughs> pattern, I would say. Um, and it didn't help that the only time, it, like it probably blended well in primarily gray environments, but it really stood out uh, particularly in dark conditions. It was not, it was not, um, I would say it was tested thoroughly with everything except common sense. Uh, <laughs> and like a, pri a private could look at it and say, I don't, I don't think this is a good idea, but somehow the army was able to spend millions of dollars in testing and, and say it was, yeah. uh, it was, it was ill-fated. It didn't help that the uniform itself was really bad. Um, the, the weak part of that uniform, the crotch tended to break, uh, at all the wrong times. I don't know if there's a good time uh, for the crotch <laughs> to break, but, but yeah, so, so the uniform fell apart and it was a color that made you stand out in most environments. So oh. it was, it was tragic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
just had to get that out of the way first. What what is the military uniform fabric made out of and how like how hard would it be to select a fabric to do what that uniform is supposed to do? Yeah. Military fabrics a 50/50 uh nylon and cotton ripstop. It's got a ripstop every quarter inch. It's a it's a very run of the mill inexpensive um cloth just because they're asking the, the life expected life lifespan of a uniform is eight months or one deployment so uh so it's not really intended for durability it's intended to be cheap honestly yeah um yeah so so it's inexpensive it's not terrible in cold weather or in wet weather um it's it and it doesn't burn everything in the army you can't uh be in a fire and get get laminated uh so <laughs> So that is a requirement for uniforms. Yeah. So that's kind of a perfect segue into one of our next questions, which is why aren't certain fabrics more popular in military applications? So fabrics that come to mind are things like DCF or ultra or, you know, to simplify fabrics or materials with a UHMWPE quality, often known as having a pretty low melting point, but ridiculous strength. Mm -hmm. What are other fabrics that you wish met the qualifications that you needed in battlefield applications? Yeah, great question. Uh, I feel like the, the military is a very conservative organization. And uh, so change is slow. And the past is usually what is drawn on for uh, in development, uh, which, you know, obviously, in, in, a, in a time when fabric is advancing at a really rapid or exponential rate, I would say, um, the military can't keep up and is, is probably not, it's, it, it used to be like 20 years behind. Now it's light years behind just because of the rate of progression. Um, to answer your question, I feel like XPAC uh, really needs to be um, incorporated into packs and uh, kit that the military uses. Um, another another uh, type of fabric that I really wish we could sort out is tweave um, for, for uniforms and such um, because it's just so comfortable. Um, it wears well and it's comfortable, um, you know, fairly abrasion resistant, but the problem again with the military is, uh, that stuff, if you get, if you, if you're, if you're on fire, it's not going to be a good time. So, um, until I, I feel like it with a little bit of, uh, money and thought, you could probably solve that problem. But for now, Tweave is, is, is a, is a dream for me. I think, um, you might have a similar experience, but I think part of it is also, uh, you can't really hand a you know, $200 pack, let's, let's assume, you know, the, the government contract is for a $200, uh, rucksack. Um, they're getting it cheap, but it's made out of good fabric X pack, you know, uh, just good quality stuff. You can't really hand that to, you know, private snuffy who's 18, 19 years, years old and who's like being yelled at to get all their shit their stuff together <laughs> uh and like they're freaking Isaac out immediately went military <laughs> yeah he was like turn it on <laughs> they're like freaking out to get all their stuff together they're like trying to pack everything as quick as they can they're just like pulling on stuff and clipping stuff together and like and the next thing you know it's like breaking right <laughs> and then they're gonna go to their supply and try and get another one and then the government is gonna have to give them another one right to replace yeah, that yeah so in a lot of cases for regular uh Regular forces, um, I think it's just unattainable to have gear like that to hand out to everybody, right? Yeah. I, to some degree, I would agree. The lowest common denominator certainly hurts uh, the military. I remember, I remember being uh, a private and watching this other private um, carry something called, they're called air items. They're basically things that wrap around a backpack to uh, allow you to jump out of a plane with it. They're ridiculously heavy, all like impregnated uh, nylon with metal buckles. And I mean, probably, probably five pounds for the whole setup. And he walked around for three days with that in his cargo pocket. And, you know, I mean, nobody, <laughs> nobody could figure out why, why he didn't just put it in his ruck, but obviously his cargo pocket blew out and that's, you know, where I'm going with this. Um, so yeah, like people's, you know, uh, the, the lowest common denominator does really drive some of the military production. Um, I don't think it's insurmountable though. I, I, to me, part of the limitation is actually the defense industry, um, is so, uh, ingrained in a certain way of doing things that there's really, you know, no competitor. Uh, you know, imagine you were like a, a small shop, 
um, who made this revolutionary pack. And you can make the government price. It wouldn't be all that challenging. But now you're going to have to produce 500,000 units of it. Yeah. And now, next thing you know, uh, you know, there's a there's a much larger company who's going to swoop in with their Cordura pack and kind of maintain the status quo. Um, so, so yeah, certainly there's several factors at work in there. We talk a lot about the fabric application triad, which is price, durability, and weight. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we tell Ripstop by the Roll consumers and people looking to make their own gear at home is you often have to figure out a priority between those to get the best application. What is the most important? What are you willing to sacrifice? What, you know, those, those things. For the military applications, it seems like durability above all else is the only thing. Yeah, I would say that's very true. Um, and often not rationally so. Um, I remember, I think it was uh, Cry Precision was changing changing uh, some stuff around. And they went from a 500 denier Cordura on, on these pouches they had down to a 330. And I, you would not believe the weeping and gnashing of teeth that, that occurred when people were like, this thing's going to wear out. And, you know, what's interesting is I actually grabbed as many of those as I could uh, because, you know, we immediately went away from them because they're going to fail. And I grabbed up as many as I could because um, I like the weight. I like the weight trade off. I actually uh, shaved all the molly off the back end and then I'd sew it straight onto a plate carrier. Um, And what that does, it saves weight and it saves a lot of bulk too, Uh, particularly when you sew pouches straight onto a carrier. Um, One of the things that is a constant source of irritation. If, if any military vehicle is not designed like a civilian vehicle, it's basically just a, uh, a minefield of wires, the whole thing. And, and everything's sharp and wants yeah, to hurt you. Yeah. Yeah. I was, <laughs> it's funny. I, I was, uh, on a drive once with, with a, uh, like a completely different unit and they were using, I think MRAPs and, <clears throat> we all got in the MRAP and I had never been in an MRAP before. And uh, the, I watched this guy buckle his seatbelt and my, all of my training was like, don't buckle your seatbelt. Cause you got to get out fast. And we went over about one bump and I hit the ceiling and I was like, okay, I guess I'm buckling my seatbelt. <laughs> and you know, clearly it was a lesson they had learned that we had not, but it was just, you know, a different vehicle. Um, anyway, so all that going back to my, my fabric, uh, comment is to say that, um, cables will hook you up and at night you can't figure out why it's like it's like there's a there's an invisible alien holding you in place it's super frustrating so to prevent that i would cut molly off and then i would i would sew the edges of a pouch onto the uh, thing so that molly would or that uh, cable would just slide right over and uh, it was really efficient um but <laughs> you had to know people in the uh, in the rigger loft because uh if you need to change out the pouch, obviously you're seam ripping it off and then sewing a new one on. So, uh, yeah, it, it became a little bit, uh, time involved, uh, unless you could find a really universal pouch. It seems like there's this really interesting balance of, well, uh, of ultralight, you know, like, and we talk a lot on this podcast about ultralight hiking and ways to cut weight and fabrics. You can cut weight. Is that something that your type of do in terms of like figuring out how to save weight? for a mission or whatever? Yeah, I would say, uh, and, and I, I'm sure you know the same thing that, uh, you essentially pile up all the, what they would call mission essential equipment, you know, all the bullets and stuff. And then you're like, what do I not need? What, yeah. What else, what else am I going to carry? Because like maybe a little bit of food, a little bit of water. And, you know, if you're lucky, a poncho liner or something to get you across the finish line, because, you know, um, and I would say it is a primary difference between, uh, you know, I like to do, uh, backpacking and, and running in my spare time. Um, but the, just the vast amount of weight you have involved, um, you can't really cut corners a lot of times with that weight. Like <laughs> for planning purposes, uh, a, um, uh, machine gun, uh, hundred round link weighs seven pounds per hundred rounds. So if you're carrying 2,300 rounds, that, that stacks up pretty fast, you know, uh, I'm trying to do the math, but that's a lot, right? <laughs> And, uh, and so it's hard to be ultralight. And at the same time, you, I, I guess the difference is you're not ultralight, you're minimalist, uh, because you're carrying the least amount of very heavy stuff you can and nothing else. Um, and so that is sort of a, a major difference, um, in this, in the, you know, ultralight world, you can use, you can kind of baby fabrics, 
uh, I was <laughs> I was thinking about buying a, one of those um, Eno uh, Sub Six hammocks a while back. Uh, it's an ultralight hammock, less than six ounces. Uh, and then I started reading all the all the comments, and like all the comments were like, "Don't let it touch the ground. If it touches the ground, there's going to be big holes in it." And you know that that's fine because you just know that your hammock needs to be kind of handled with care. Uh, don't go dragging it over rocks or anything. Uh, but you know, at night you're not going to be handling stuff with care. It's going to be holding sharp, pointy things. Uh, you know, so in the military application, uh, you're cutting, you're shaving all the weight you can, but at the same time, you're having to go heavy on a lot of things. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't cut a lot of things. Um, I think one of the heaviest loads I ever carried, uh, for, uh, you know, an overseas trip was, uh, I was walking out the door with 110 pounds on, uh, and that was just really bad. It was, <laughs> it was a lot of weight. Um, but you know, you kind of got used to it by the end of the trip. I wouldn't say it was ever enjoyable, but, um, then I remember, uh, a, a year later or so I was, uh, with some friends hiking Rainier and we, we had hired a guide and the guide, <laughs> Uh, we were going to be up there for the week. And so I brought, um, a, my beer, I, I bought bottled beer because they didn't have the kind I wanted in a can. And my, my guide's head was just exploding because, uh, they couldn't believe that I was willing to take on that weight, but a 45 pound backpack doesn't seem too heavy. You know, when you're thinking about that 110 before, you know, I would sure, I'm sure for the guide who's like, they don't want to carry, you know, they've been up there yeah. so many times. They're like, I'll go without a toothbrush. <laughs> So let's talk about like systems because um, a lot of things in DIY as well as the military are about systems. Um, and so just tell us about like um, kind of uh, did you have any systems that you liked to, to DIY, you know, other than like the Molly that you talked about that you cut off. Mm -hmm. um, like tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I'd say the, probably the one system that most people spend as much time as they can on is, uh, the kind of your body armor. Um, so the body armor is something you're going to be wearing most of the time. Um, and it, it's, it's probably the most important piece of equipment for you because it's going to be holding all of your other equipment on it. So you're going to have this thing that's protecting your life. And then on the outside of this thing is all of your essentials, your your magazines, your water, your radio. And so like things that, that seem pretty simple, like a radio actually involve several pieces like a radio and then a, um, uh, 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 ATT. yeah, push to talk. And then, you know, however, it's going to get into your ear. And now your system went from just this radio to three pieces that now if you're smart, you're either Velcroing or you're taping or you're rubber banding in place so they don't get away from you. More wires too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More cables to, uh, to choke you up at all the wrong times. Um, so I would say the body armor system is probably the one most people spend the most time modifying if they're, if they're able to. Um, I, I certainly did. And, uh, when the first, the first body armor set that I had was a really heavy thousand denier Cordura, um, and I just, I didn't like it to the point I, um, I started making my own. Uh, I wanted something that had less soft armor coverage because I was, my main concern was, was getting, uh, bullets in me. And so <laughs> stopping that from happening was, was, yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. tough sometimes. Yeah. It's mean streets out here. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but, but yeah, I wasn't as concerned about, uh, things like, uh, like grenade fragments or anything like that. It was, it was mostly uh, plates that I was trying to put in front of me. Um, so once then I started just kind of sewing my own pouches to hold those things. Now you have to sew shoulder straps onto it. And now you have to sew, uh, an attachment system. Uh, it, I, I think when I first saw a Cobra buckle, like back of my head exploded and, uh, yeah, it's like, to, cause that was pretty cutting edge at the time. And so I incorporated that into my, into my body armor system as a means of attaching it. Um, because it was fast release and, you know, one of the interesting things we're talking about how heavy you are. Um, so you also want to get out of that armor fast. Uh, you, and, and so you want to develop a system that you can get out of fast. I remember I was, uh, I was overseas once and we were, we were walking and, uh, I saw this ditch and they were, they were pretty 
normal to see these ditches. You just jump over them. Um, well, I, I didn't see it, but there was like bushes over the bank. So when I jumped, I jumped into the bushes and straight into the ditch, which was maybe three feet wide, but well over six feet deep because uh because I, w- I went in over my head and i remember thinking like oh is this how i die you know <laughs> uh and then uh, fortunately you know like i'm going through in my mind like getting rid of my helmet getting rid of my body armor and and then somebody just like reached in and grabbed me and pulled me out uh, and then they were laughing at me for the rest of the night <laughs> i was the only one wet uh but <laughs> But yeah, it's it's one of those things that now, like every part of the system has to has to come off quickly, right? Um, so yeah, the body armor was was really interesting. Uh, everybody has their own take on it. Um, everybody sets sets it up a little bit different, and particularly when you're sewing uh, rather than attaching with Molly, you have to be able to change um, configurations fairly quickly because you might not. You, maybe one day you decide, oh, I should probably this is going to be a bad job. I need to carry an extra magazine. So. Uh, so yeah, I would say body armor was the big system that everybody plays with. Let's talk about two of those systems that you mentioned, Velcro and Molly. Benefit being they come off really easily, super modular. Downside, Velcro is incredibly loud mm-hmm. and in sandy conditions can get pretty clogged up, right? Yeah. What are other strengths, weaknesses, or what would you like to see in replace of those systems? Yeah, man, it's a great question because yeah, the army loves some Velcro and, uh, and it's it's odd because you know coming in in the in the nineties the army hated Velcro. You were not allowed to wear Velcro because the assumption was you're going to be patrolling in a jungle, and when you go <laughs> and open your your open your pouch up, everybody's going to hear it. Uh, so it was all buttons at the time, and buttons are equally horrible. Don't get me started on buttons, but um, yeah. So so Velcro particularly, like, what do you do? Because a lot of times you need the convenience of a quick in and out um but how you do it without the noise and and i r- truly have no answer i feel like i feel like snaps i've seen snaps work uh but you you either go with heavy metal snaps or you go with lightweight breakable plastic snaps um so man like the best solution i've ever seen is having pockets that are made in such a way that they just open and close uh, with no snaps, essentially, like you know how on the uh, the military uniform, the the front side of your cargo pocket is sewed all the way down, and then the back side is left open so that you can sort of reach in from back to front and get your stuff and come back out. Um, and it's not perfect, uh, but I feel like uh, Cry Precision made it made a much did a much better job of getting a cargo pocket that holds itself closed. Um, and so that's that's essentially the best way. What you see typically is people uh, leave, like on the on the military uniform, they leave the back side buttoned, the front side open, and then you can still get into it and out of it. Um, I've also seen zippers. Uh, zippers are quiet. Uh, they're heavy in metal, and it seems like it never fails that you're leaning against it for thirty minutes of a time at a time with it just digging into your into your arm or leg or whatever. So. My, my experience with zippers is that uh, with the, uh, you know, w- with paying as little for construction as possible, most of the time the seams aren't finished on the inside, right? Yeah. So with the zippers, the problem that I've run into is all those seams on the inside will start to fray and they'll get caught up in the zipper. Mm-hmm. Um, and typically, like what I've seen zippers, they're like heavy metal zippers and they just like the fabric just gets caught up in that zipper and then no. yeah and it just gets to the point where you can barely open it because there's so many you know loose threads that are just caught up in that slot. yeah oh absolutely yeah all zippers are not created equal yeah. for sure and and also construction is is pretty key um yeah the other thing too and you'll see it a lot on on sleeping bags is that i don't know how it happens but the material is always in your zipper and and uh <laughs> it's not a big deal in the daytime, but at night when you can't see, you're just like cursing, <laughs> cursing why you can't, uh, yeah. can't get your sleeping bag open. Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know if there's a good way of attaching. I would say Velcro is an okay way. Uh, you will certainly come to a point in your, in your time when you're, you wish it was quieter. <laughs> there's no, no way of getting around that. Uh, but it really is an okay solution. Um, there's one other uh, thing you'll see sometimes is is bungee bungee locks. Um, they're they're LA straps. They're even in the military. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and they work okay. 
uh, until they don't, I would say Bungie's big weakness is, you know, when you're crawling or you're in the prone or whatever, uh, stuff tends to slide out. So, man, I'm, I I think the answer is there is no answer. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I can't think of anything that meets that many qualifications, right? It seems like what like what you needed to do is beyond the, like anything has its limitations and you needed to have zero limitations in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, right. like I think the closest thing that I've seen, um, and I haven't seen it on like a, a uniform or anything yet, but um, companies like Duraflex and Wujin are starting to make like magnetic snaps. Yeah. Um, and they have like a kind of a plastic, um, almost like a, a hood, I guess that the magnet kind of like pops into um, so that it, kind of prevents it from like sliding around but then when you need to open it you just pull down a little bit and pop it open but then again magnets can be kind of loud too you know you have the click of the magnet so heavy occasionally yeah yeah it's 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 a great question like one magnet no big deal but when you put say 20 of them to attach a uniform together now you know you're you know all the pockets are it's going to start to add up yeah um no it's a great question i've also seen kind of some tube style attachments that uh show promise uh i don't know if they're there yet but they are it's kind of like a new take on a ziploc baggie closure um that 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 could be uh really interesting i i'm interested to see where the technology goes but but for now i don't i think we're working with like you said the triad of lightweight price durability um the army's like let's just take one and it's durability um and uh and and similar for closing devices is is i'm not sure you're gonna get all three sides of that triad what are some other notes that you think the military could use for, for or the notes they could take from the ultralight backpacking world to application or maybe notes that you've taken for your own kit? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, I feel like the ultralight community uh, is so good at describing exactly what they need and nothing more. And the army is loves to plan for more <laughs> so so i feel like even if you just took the ethos of that like what is what is the minimum needed to get across the finish line and and uh cut away from that like um i'm not sure if you isaac remember the uh, the replacement to the alice rucksack was uh this like really heavy cordura job that had all these other you could you could take the side pa- pouches off and make a new pack out of it you could take the top flap off make a different pack and all of those like were horrible, horrible designs. The features were awful. Uh, all they had was straps. Uh, and then, the, then when you put the whole thing together, like you look like a gypsy camp walking around. It was terrible. Um, but it briefed really well. And people's minds are like, "You got options. You got more. Do you want more? Uh, no, you actually don't." Uh, and that's to me what the ultralight community and what I've really taken away. Um, the pack I brought today. Um, a really great Gregory pack, uh, that I just, I carry it for, you know, my everyday sort of walking around stuff. But even that pack I shaved, I, I hot knifed off a lot of pieces because they just weren't necessary and weren't useful. And so, um, I feel like the, the military and particularly like defense application, it would be really nice if people would minimize, just find the essentials and make that happen. Uh, as far as fabrics go, um, the military loves Cordura, like I said, and they love Thousand Denier Cordura. Um, and it's funny because the Cordura is not bomb-proof by any means. It's very abrasion-resistant. But I, I remember I had a buddy <laughs> um, strapped a pack to the outside of a vehicle, and he didn't realize that his pack was sitting really low on the exhaust pipe. And when he when we got done with our movement, his uh, his body armor had melted uh, a significant portion of it had been laying on the exhaust pipe and melted all the way through the backpack and into his, into his armor. Um, so yeah, I mean, he was, he was using something else for the, the night. Um, but, but yeah, Cordura, like people see it as the easy button, but I would love to see some X pack. I would love to see, I mean, there's a lot of places that even if you, if you insist on Cordura, you could go with, you know, like any sort of a 210 rip stop or, you know, much lighter, you know, uh, or even, even a 330 denier Cordura, which surprisingly has held together nicely. Um, I guess if you're laying something on the exhaust pipe, it doesn't really matter what it is any longer. Yeah. I think we're back to the lowest common denominator. <laughs> like you can't, you can't succeed in that environment. Like even really nice stuff is going to fail. Um, yeah. So I, I think that, um, you know, obviously, uh, people who sell to military are going to 
use something tried and true. Um, and so it'd be nice to get some innovators out there to, you know, probably from the hunting community would be, would see, be where I think you could see some sort of a, you know, nexus because hunters are all about cutting weight. Um, and they also insist on it being all the same color of camouflage. Uh, so, so yeah, I was going to say earlier, um, when we were talking about finding new fabrics that kind of fit the bill. Um, I think one of the biggest problems is just cries, uh, you know, their patent on multicam yeah. and like other, uh, like OCP stuff, right? Like it's hard to find these high tech fabrics in those patterns. Um, and I mean, you have some other colors that you can use like coyote Brown or, or, uh, olive drab or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's a lot of the, the pattern too, that, that makes a difference. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, if you use multicam, you're driving a price point. So for yeah. somebody trying to get across the finish line, uh, you know, getting a material to market or a, or a product to market, um, they're probably going to cut, um, cut cost in terms of the fabric they use, you know? So now you're right back at Cordura. Yeah. Um, that's something we talked about with Butch Whiting from Cryptech too, is that it's really hard to get a good pattern onto a fabric that's completely, um, I don't know what the technical term is, but it has the same effect even with night vision stuff, right? Like it's sometimes hard to print that on to the right fabric and some fabrics light up, you know? Yeah. You can't just sublimate it on there. Yeah. Actually, I, yeah, I think the term is near IR, uh, which is what what uh, night, night vision, you know, uh, camera or uh, device is going to be seeing. And uh, typically, um, th- a lot of a lot of fabrics stand out unless they're coated or unless they have a camouflage pattern that um, that contrasts well during in that uh, near IR uh, light spectrum. Uh, but you know, I, honestly, yeah, this is a place where I think the military could kind of be your your proving ground because you know the military will accept several different colors of things so it, like you said coyote is fine uh you know it doesn't have to be multicam you could probably get away making a, a you know pouch or plate carrier or whatever out of uh out of an x-pack let's say um or w- what's it like an example of one of the heavier more durable uh fabrics like that one is that one you showed me earlier an ultra yeah or- yeah. So like that. yeah, like anything like that, that that's going to be very abrasion resistant and just, it doesn't have to be, you know, you could, you could get away with a coyote or a black, something like that, a simpler, um, simpler color, mm-hmm. as long as it was coated and, and, and worked well at night. So one thing I want to talk about are the sew shops or the rigger sheds that you call, that you call them yeah. uh, on base. I think all of us listening have sewing machines at home. And if we're lucky, we have our own sew shops at home where we have <laughs> one or two machines with some stuff displayed in a cool way. And we're like, oh man, we've really made it now. Now we're a real DIYer. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the Mecca that is a, uh, <laughs> a rigger shed on base. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's funny because uh, I, I happen to know some people that were, you know, riggers and their job is really just to pack, maintain and inspect parachutes and so obviously the the maintenance phase is going to involve some sewing it's going to have to be very precise technical sewing because you're not you don't want to mess around with uh with a parachute right you gotta you gotta get it right uh so so these these you know shops are uh outfitted with pretty good equipment and uh it, it's funny i remember actually watching you um uh, do uh edge uh what do you call that uh, seam, oh, binding, uh, binding, edge binding by hand. And I was like, Oh my God, that looks hard. <laughs> Cause you just go to the rigger shed and there's a, uh, there's an edge binder machine that does it all for you. And, uh, uh yeah. So if you know, so they are very, it's, it's a hard crew to get in with because obviously they don't want people breaking their stuff. Um, and, and, you know, there's a little bit of a buy-in in terms of technical know-how. Um, but if you can get in there, you can start kind of making your own stuff and, um, uh, the it, it's just like a, a quantum leap in terms of uh approach to stuff like um bar tacking for instance uh i've never bar tacked by hand you just go to the bar tack machine and like hit the <laughs> hit the size you the the length you want and they uh and it goes uh and then and then when you break it you you go ask a rigger to help you fix it <laughs> uh which has been my experience uh, and you 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 might need to uh to bribe them suitably uh if, if you start breaking stuff on the regular but um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, I didn't realize how lucky I was in the beginning because I was doing things at a fairly advanced level that I 
had never done by hand or or manually. Uh, I was using I was using their uh, equipment. Uh, so yeah, just just little stuff like that. Even um, I can't remember what kind of a sewing machine you call it, where uh, the the bottom comes up and you can actually just throw things over the uh, over the whole thing uh, rather than taking the whole thing apart. Um, do you know what uh, you know what I'm talking about? A long arm, yeah, yeah, like a long arm, a long, yeah, essentially. I, I I can't remember the name for it, but yeah, that was like mind blowing because I was trying to sew a pouch to a existing, uh, I think an existing plate carrier, uh, uh, existing body armor kit, and so I was able to just open the bottom up, put the whole thing over, and sew my pouch on without having to like cut the. Uh, body armor in half sew it on and then re-sew it together <laughs> obviously that's going to be prohibitive in terms of time so yeah the the rigger sheds were like very nice to have and it's it's unusual to get access to them because you know they, they really don't want a ton of people in there break, breaking all their stuff what sort of tools or uh are there things that you'd see in a rigger shed that you wouldn't see in a normal myog shop in terms of thread or scissors or I'm imagining a lot of Cordura. I'm imagining a lot of like khaki thread. <laughs> what else? You, you know, you're in a good one when they have uh, um, nylon uh, webbing in coyote, black, and multicam. That's like, those are your three options. You know, <laughs> you're, you're, in a, you're in a low rent one when they only have green. <laughs> is, is that it? Like 1500 pound webbing? Is that like just the yeah. run of the mill? Yeah. So it is the, the 1500 pound. Uh, yeah. And, you know, so obviously the, the most interesting things you're going to see in rigger sheds are going to be the, the very heavy items because, you know, a, you know, a lot of places, they're not just dropping people out of planes, they're dropping equipment out. So now you're talking buckles rated to 10,000 pounds, uh, you know, which that's probably not on your, uh, ultralight backpack, right? <laughs> probably not. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to think of the strongest buckle we have, and I don't imagine it's rated for more than like... 150 pounds yeah. at best. <laughs> yeah. 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 So these are like, they're going on to 10,000 pound webbing with a 10,000 pound buckle. And now you're talking like very big equipment, uh, and like, um, very big equipment to repair the, those buckles and things. Yeah. It's, it's quite interesting. Another thing you'll see that's, that I, I always cracks me up is, uh, things in a rigger shed that, that are meant to fall apart and never go back together again. Um, so there's this thing called in the army called 80 pound test line that you see it all the time. And I, I, I'm guessing the assumption is it breaks at 80 pounds. Um, but riggers use it to tie things to other things that need to be tied up nicely. And then when they get out of the airplane, the whole thing breaks apart. So, so it's a really odd, uh, like combination of like things that are supposed to last forever and not fall apart. And then, no, no, it's a cool if this thing falls apart. Uh, it just it, We're just tying it right here because it needs, like, maybe the parachute needs to go right in the middle of the uh, piece of equipment or whatever. Um, but, yeah, so I, I've always yeah, I've always liked seeing that because you're like, I don't know. In, in my mind, I want to go out there and just uh, put it on an enforcer and, and break test it. And like, <laughs> oh, no, it's 81-pound test. 81-pound <laughs> test line. Yeah. Still has a good ring to it. I yeah, think. it does. It does. I feel like uh, the company would have to, you know, come up with a better marketing plan. Like eight, eighty-one pound test doesn't 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 go the same for me. It's actually V two. You know, they made it one go. pound strong. <laughs> so that's the uh, the competitor that <laughs> yeah to market like oh theirs breaks at eighty, ours breaks at eighty-one. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good plan. Maybe and maybe if you could probably pull this off selling to the military, but for that situation where you need to break at seventy-nine, here's some seventy-nine pound test. <laughs> That's just the lot that went through with like the bad <laughs> yeah. machine, you know, <laughs> it got some oil on it or something. <laughs> so you've been dealing with, uh, weight management and construction and all these things for, like you said, over 20 years. What does this look like now in terms of your personal kit as an ultra runner, a backpacker, avid hiker and stuff? What do you use personally and how do you now balance that weight that you don't have to worry about carrying rounds of a uh, machine gun with you, but you're you know, want to go camping with your kids? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's a great question because I feel like uh, part of the minimalist in me thinks I'm an ultralight guy. And uh, so I'll go, I, I went out and bought uh, a couple ultralight items and uh, realized I didn't like them because what I really like doing is throwing bulky objects in a backpack and not worrying about it. And the, the, you know, the, the, one of the things that in my opinion defines kind of an ultralight person is just this care and concern they're taking with load management. 
Um, and so particularly when you're going to be on a hike with a three-year-old, you're not, you're not skimping on load management. You're like throwing like the, two diapers, let's make it three, you know, like you want extra stuff because he's going to fall in, in everything and get all the things and you want to, you want to have contingencies. Right. So I realized when I realized that, like, I, I love ultralight stuff, believe me. Uh, like one, of one of the things I like to run with is, is a Nathan, um, uh, the vapor crar, I believe, uh, running vest, which I think it weighs six ounces, empty 6.8, something like that. And that's unbelievable. I, I used to run with a old, thousand denier camelback uh that weighed a lot more and like so that kind of weight and breathe pounds yeah i mean yeah that kind of weight and breathability is unbelievable but you know ultra running your your load is is very well managed you know so so i think i think for me the application is the application and one of the things i used to try to do is make one thing fit everything uh and it just that's not possible uh, but so like, for instance, I'm, I'm a big fan of Gregory Pax. Uh, now they have, because of the load management, they, they almost all have a internal, uh, I think it's called a hoop frame, um, that is rigid enough to keep stuff off your back. And, you know, obviously we're here in the South, it's hot. So it's got a little bit of ventilation. Uh, I think if I live somewhere else, that wouldn't be important, but it is here. Um, and, but it still has some sort of a frame because the stuff I carry is still not ultralight yeah. and you know uh you know maybe one day it won't be that way but uh but what i found was that you could modify that same gregory pack to be much much lighter um and and still get the frame you need and the support you need at the bottom we went camping together earlier this summer and it was only a night but when you're camping with a couple of kids the things that you just kind of toss in add up so much too so i could yeah. see why it's so awesome to have a pack that has a good structure that you can toss around quite a bit more just because it's going to vary. I mean, I've, I've run with you and it's very different. <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the, the load distribution is very, very different when it's just us going out for a couple hours or a night versus managing a couple of kids. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mind having a bad time. I'm okay. I'm very okay with that. Uh, but, but kids, they don't like having a bad time. <laughs> so you, you need to carry everything to ensure they're not going to have a bad time. Yeah. It's, it's different. And, uh, and I, I feel kind of fortunate in that I got so used to so much weight that that now you know putting a couple extra pounds in a pack is not a not a problem for me you know, uh, but but yeah I can see, um, you know like like I said the 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 application kind of drives the amount of weight you you want so like f I'm I'm getting ready for an ultra and uh, and I'm looking for every place I can shave ounces. Uh, uh, I, I I recently had this big crisis uh, trying to figure out if I should do bottles in front on my on my running pack or camelback in back on my on my running pack just to to save a few ounces of water you know well uh james thanks so much for joining us thanks for coming into the content cottage uh carter's yelling right now from his house silently he knows i said that and is calling it a mobile mini um, or prison trailer but we really appreciate you sharing these stories and the time um thanks for joining us today yeah thanks for having me and now now i'm gonna go back into your warehouse tried steal stuff <laughs> awesome right. well have a great day thanks a lot